morning and good day to everyone in this webinar today. So uh, we are honored to have all of you here, uh, the respective speakers and the audience. So on behalf of the organizer, the program of architecture, UTM, um, I would like to extend my, my warm welcome to the international webinar series. So uh, for your information, this is our fourth international webinar series that involved three architecture schools together with the uh, program of architecture, UTM, uh, um, SASI Creative School of Architecture, India, and Velo Institute of In Technology, India, um, to collaborate and disseminate knowledge to the audience. And not to forget um, the audience of the webinar series today, not only from Malaysia and India, uh, but potentially all over the world. So uh, we would like to welcome you with open heart and thank you for joining our webinar series today. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Noor Izura from UTM, and I'll be taking the role of moderator for this session today. And um, I'm glad to welcome all our four guest speakers for this webinar series. The first is Professor Gayatri Biswanathan from SASI Creative School of Architecture, who will be talking about gender equal cities perspective of the past and the future. Our second speaker from the University of um, University Technology Malaysia, Dr. Sharifa Salwa Said Mahza, who will be talking about space syntax and the development of architecture studio with evidence-based design decision methods. And then um, our third speaker, Professor, Professor Minakshi Papu from uh, Velo Institute of Technology, who will be talking about ameliorating urban housing. And our fourth speaker, architect Samsia Abdullah, from the UTM uh, will be presenting a topic of needs for social neighborhood space in affordable housing, a case study. And um, for all the audience, I will attach the attendance link in the chat box near to the end of the session. And uh, please fill in the link so that uh, we can send you the webinar e-certificate later. Um, and please take note for each speaker, the time allocated for each talk is 20 minutes and we are going to start with our speaker number one, uh, followed by speaker number two and three and finally with, uh, with speaker number four. And then uh, we will have another 20 minutes for question and answer session with the speakers. So audience are free to ask questions during this period and uh, should you have any question during the talk, uh, you are welcome to write your question in the chat section in the bottom right corner of the Webex window. Um, I will bring them forward during the Q&A session afterwards. Yeah, And then uh, we will have a session, a photo session together with the speakers and all the audiences at the end of our session later. So um, before we proceed, I would like to invite um, our beloved Associate Professor Dr. Eli Sabrina Ismail the Director of Architecture Program, University of Technology Malaysia, to give her opening remarks. So I'll pass the session to you, Dr. Alice. Thank All you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator, Dr. Izura. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, welcome and selamat datang. Um, and namaste to all. And today is actually a very special day for the International Webinar Series 4 organized by University Technology Malaysia because we have four beautiful ladies, okay, which will be the honorable speaker for today. From UTM, we have two important speakers, Dr. Sharifa Salwa, who is an expert on space in text. We have the practicing architect, um, Samsia Abdullah, who is also doing a lot of research on affordable housing. And also from SASI Creative School of Architecture, Prof. Gayatri Wiswanathan, and from VIT, Velour Institute of Technology, which is Prof. Manakshi Papu. So to me, today is Women Day. Okay. So ladies rule, feminism, all right? And uh, what I'm saying is that beauty with brains to all the four of you. Okay, so today's webinar talk is actually an important talk uh, because as the director of the UTM Architecture School, I feel so honored to have these four wonderful, prominent, successful lady speakers that not only will share their interests in each area focusing on the issue of housing across the globe, but we are looking into two different contexts of country, India and Malaysia, and looking at the global issue, which is the issue of housing and human settlements, which is a very big challenge faced by all today. And I think it is also an unfortunate event also for us in Malaysia, because I think two days ago, we are facing um, the flood issue, especially in our city center in Kuala Lumpur, and there are so many people affected uh, with these flood matters. So I think this is also a big challenge that relating to the um, 
new development, especially looking into housing development, especially in big urban cities. So I hope today intellectual discourse will act as a, some sort like a starting point that will spark the discourse on housing and human settlement in the 21st century and looking what are the best options, the best practices, the best approaches for academicians to give their best ideas and input based on our researchers to improve the quality of life and the way how we live in. So today's discourse is also a collaborative effort between three institutions representing India and Malaysia and I hope that this course will strengthen the ties for further research and academic collaboration between Valor Institute Technology, Wits Park Architecture School and SASI Creative School of Architecture and with uh, University Technology Malaysia UTM Architecture School. So I wish everyone the very best to the four beautiful ladies. Uh, Good luck and all the best for your presentation today. And we look forward to the collaboration between UTM, VIT, and also SASI. So thank you so much. And I pass it back to the moderator, Dr. Izura. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Alice, for the welcoming remarks. So um, without further ado, I shall welcome our first speaker of the session, Professor Gaya Tri Biswanathan from SASI Creative School of Architecture with the title of Gender Equal Cities Perspective of the Past and the future. The room is yours, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, hope I'm audible. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, I, could, I should say good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, Professor Alice, I guess I chose my subject correctly, gender equal cities. And today we have four ladies presenting. So I guess let, without much delay, I will start with the presentation. My uh, screen is visible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, as uh, Dr. Izura said, my topic is general equal gender equal cities perspectives of the past and the future. Uh, <clears throat> okay. To start off with, let's see what is gender equality. So, uh, gender equality it is not only a fundamental human right. But uh, it is a necessary foundation for a peaceful, pros prosperous, and uh, sustainable world. So when we say about gender equality, it is about uh, providing women and girls with equal access to education, health care, uh, representation in political and economic decision-making process, which will actually benefit societies and humanity at large. Uh, UNICEF says gender equality means that women and men girls and boys enjoy the same right resources opportunities and protections and uh, unesco unesco also believes that all form of discrimination based on gender and violation of human rights uh, as well as significant barrier to the achievement of the 2030 agenda of the sustainable development which is the 17 sustainable development goals so here the message is really very clear women and men should enjoy equal rights choices power, knowledge, equal citizenship. So we need to equip both girls, boys, the values, attitudes, and skills to tackle gender disparities. Now let's look into some uh, metrics and statistics that is needed to substantiate the need for gender equality. Okay. To start off with, let's go with the history since 1900. So here in this uh, slide, we, are, we see three figures, figure A, B, and C. So figure A here represents the uh, female to male average years of schooling across the world from 1920 to 210. So you can see that the graph is increased. And in figure B, we can see the female to male labor force participation in the world. And in figure C, uh, we can see the gender equality index so all the three figures shows that from 1900 till 2010 that is a past decade there has been a gradual increase uh, of the gender the female participation okay now going into the statistics now uh, the world economic forum 
uh, it had released a global gender gap report in 2020. Now, this was a survey done out of 153 countries, and here you can see the first top 10 countries. Now, when the survey was done, they had taken into consideration four key areas. One is economic participation and opportunity, one is education, one is health, and one is political empowerment. Now here, uh, this report, which was uh, uh, published in 2020, here you can see that Iceland stands first, and you should also know, know that for the past 11 years, Iceland has been in the top 10 number one. And after Iceland, you can see that it is Norway, Finland, Sweden, followed by the other uh, five countries. But specifically, uh, I should uh, say that in 2018, uh, Spain, Spain, uh, uh, <clears throat> it was nominated as the world's most female-centric government in 2018. And in 2019, Egypt, it became the first country in the Middle East and Africa to close a, <clears throat> To launch a close to have the uh, gender gap, it was nearing the uh, smaller size of the gender gap. But why? Because in Egypt, more of the females started uh, enrolling themselves in universities, and many of the female representation was there in many of the professional and in even in the governance part. Now, in these countries, especially in Spain and in Egypt, uh, they are working towards a three frame policies, and what they look into is. If they need to bring women into a higher position, there are a few criteria which they need to consider for the ladies. And what are the uh, criteria? This includes extended parental leave, subsidized childcare, and uh, uh, removing unconscious bias in recruitment. That means they're trying to give equal recruitment for both ladies and gents. But as part of this global gender gap ranking, they have also, and with the part of the survey, they've also seen to that that. In the next 25 to 257 years, that means it will take more 257 years to close this gender gap between male and female. This is another part of the statistics where out of 153 countries, they have seen that 83 countries, the ladies have the political empowerment. So this image here clearly shows that how much percentage of the ladies are as congresswomen, how much percentage of the lady work as women ministers. And here it says that overall in the global gender gap report, it is seen that because uh, it is seen that 25%, only 25% of the women, they are in the position of the uh, uh, governance part. And it still, it needs to come up to a higher level and even in this report, it is also seen that the education, the ladies who receive education and the ladies who receive more of health are in a slighter disparity, meaning it is 96.1% and 95.7% respectively. Okay, now what are the benefits of gender equality? There are main three benefits. When we have gender equality, it makes our communities safe and healthier. It prevents violence against women and children. And it also aids a better economy within the society. Now, when we are talking about this, let us take into consideration a few uh, studies. One is the Vienna, which is a study in Austria. Here, if you see, uh, Vienna, they have designed a neighborhood, which is a, an urban space where it is more friendly for the ladies. So here, what they have done is, it is actually uh, incorporated by the ladies who worked in the urban planning there. They have prioritized pedestrians over car users, and they have tried to bring more public spaces, more public oriented spaces with female perspectives in it. So it is more of safety towards female. Now, the second one, if you see here is Umea. This is in Sweden. Now here, they have tried to design a it is in a center, uh, in a city center park, where they have rebuilt and redesigned the park, uh, targeting the ladies. Now, what they are trying to tell here is that to become, uh, to have a healthy city, they should take the female gender into account. Their participation is more necessary because that will give a more elaborate design process.
Now the third uh, <clears throat> small study here is the uh, Barcelona's. Now Barcelona, here if you see, they have redesigned their urban space. They have tried to give in more space for ladies, have more number of trees. It, it actually they've tried to have a bigger area with more light so that female uh, feel more uh, safe when they are walking. So here what they have done is why they've had this wider pavements is for new mothers, for women with shopping bags. When we say new mothers, that means kids in the pram and women with uh, shopping bags they, when they need to walk around. And uh, here they try to also have well lit streets, open parks where you can have a longer visibility and uh, anybody can see to one from one extent to the other extent. Okay, now the question is why genders matter? Now in this image, you can see the male gender and the female gender. So here, we need to see to it that the women participation in urban plan, <clears throat> in urban planning and in governance, it has to have a gender sensitive approach. And to get that gender sensitive approach, we need to have women representation in political structures, more in governance, and women's role in advocacy, and also an inclusive approach, meaning having both male and female in the development of new urban partnerships. So when we say male and female, and when we say that we need to have women in, in inclusive in the planning, so we need to see planning with a gender perspective. So that means a woman's experience, how to use the urban environment, because it is totally different and how a male uses. Usually when you see, uh, it is more of the, uh, it's nothing against male, but I'm just telling, it is more of the uh, male's design which comes into picture. That means the woman's decision in planning is not seen. But if you see these three, in this image, if you see these three icons, it e easily shows that women's input in transportation, housing, and in services is necessary. In transportation, why? Because women totally have a distinct different requirement. They directly don't go to their workplace. For example, when they go to their workplace, they do 100 other jobs. Maybe you drop your kids in school, then you see that the daycare person has come or whatever, you maybe pick up certain medicines or whatever, and then you travel. So you need to see that the journey is not straight. It is, the, there are many uh, stops in between. So women's transportation thing is entirely different. Second is housing. Now you need to have, when you're designing for an housing program, you need to see to it that women are included in the designing. Third thing, services. Yes, now generally women cook, they do everything at home. They are the responsible people for the household. So they are the ones who would like to tell you how much water supply is needed. Is it quite safe? Is the, is the sanitation efficient? Is the solid waste removal proper in process? So actually we need to take their input. So if we see the main act, the main uh, six criteria that women need to be taken into account is the accessibility, the mobility, the safety, hygiene and health, climate resilience and uh, security of tenure. For example, whether we are living in our own house, are we owning our house? So all those criteria had to be taken care of. Gender bias in architecture. Okay. Now, if we see here, all of us are architects. Yes. Now, in the field of architecture in the early 1970s, if you see, it was more of males than females. Then in 1980s, the females started coming into picture, but it was like they finished the education or they drop out. And as soon as the education, they get settled. They don't go much into work, but all this started uh, becoming a bit, a, a, bit less after 1970s. Now, why all this was happening is there was a root cause of this problem. Maybe there was a lack of female mentors and having uh, successful ladies as architects, popular architects, the wage gap, the amount, the, the remuneration which is given to the male and the female, maybe because of long working hours for the ladies 
And after they work, they need to go back, take care of the family, the kids, and sometimes even sexual harassment. But even before 1960s, there were certain ladies who worked, and that is seen in the image here. So here, we need to have a balance in the work environment. There should be a lady representation to the society. And the ladies, they need to be bring, brought in so that there is a wider perspective. Okay. So that means women's participation is necessary. They're all, they have to be there representing in any, for example, today we are all representing in this forum. So they should be there for the representation. The second, eco economic equality, meaning there should not be a wage gap. It should be as per their experience that the remuneration is considered. And the other thing is governance. They should get into the political level. <clears throat> Okay, now I guess let's get into one or two studies which shows the gender equal city. So one such is Vienna in Austria. So here we can see that now these studies, they show that uh, if you have women participation, then it promotes to more safety and proper planning is also seen. Better representation, not just in terms of man, but also in woman. And it, it all this leads to gender equality. So let's take a small study in Vienna. Now, if you see in the image here, you can see a stage. Now, this is actually an urban square. It is called as the Rumen Plus. Here, they did a survey. The urban planning department did a survey. And there is a school nearby. So they, they, they checked with the students of that school and the students said, we would like to have a small stage in the urban plaza here. And as per their requirements, this stage was redesigned for them. And it's and the, after the redesign, it started working in 2020. Now, why this was redesigned so that this becomes a happening place, not about the stage. They even started having more trees, more seating areas and even some gathering spaces. So this was a kind of gender sensitive redesign. Now here, Vienna took into consideration the gender planning so that the, the public spaces got a gender, gender sensitive design. And here, if we see that they uh, started a uh, strategy called as the gender mainstreaming. So that means they started bringing women into picture. And uh, here, uh, what they did was <clears throat> they started giving in small icons. For example, they had a gen the gender sensitive language to communicate. In public transportation, they tried to bring in uh, small icons which showed that this seat is reserved for children, for ladies, even men who came in with kids. So it is for parents also. Now, another point in this uh, uh, urban spaces, they start, as I said earlier, they started bringing in larger pavements for ladies to walk with prams. It was more lighted and there was a row of trees and from one end to another end, it was also well lit. Okay, the next uh, study is uh, UAE. Okay, now UAE, uh, these days, ladies have flared up in UAE. Uh, there was a gender balance council which was formed in 2015. Till then, UAE was ranking 49th in the world regarding the gender equal cities. But once this uh, council was established, then in 2019, they jumped 43 positions and they came to the 26th position. And right now in 2021, there are, they are in the top 25 positions. And uh, when a survey was taken by the Georgetown University, many women felt that UAE was one of the safest countries to work with, even at nights. So it was kind of 98.5% of the women were for it. And if you see now, in UAE, they have started, uh, uh, if you know, uh, UAE has uh, seven emirates and Abu Dhabi being one of the emirates and the capital, uh, the smart city is coming up there. So as part of the smart cities program, they have the safe cities program. Here, they are trying to bring in women friendly spaces. So when we say women friendly spaces, because you know that there, there are special spaces for ladies. So they try to bring in places where they can have a range of cultural, educational, recreational activities for women and children. 
girls. And also there are certain spaces which is segregated as a play area, as a reading area, food kiosks, amphitheater, seating spaces. Now in UAE, they also have a women's museum, which is called as Beit al -Banat. Now, in this was actually established by an Emirati professor, Professor Rafia Gubash. And why was this done? It was done in order to preserve the history of women in UAE. And here you can see that uh, this displayed uh, many, uh, many various fields, like it showed about the old gold souk, it showed about the poet, it showed about all the women in history uh, in, uh, and in present uh, who have flagged up in UAE. Okay, now let's look into the top women achievers. The past, I'm sure most of you must be knowing these people, Queen Victoria, who has uh, ruled uh, and she has brought in big cultural expansions in London. Then uh, Margaret Tracha, yes, the first female to be elected as the head of the government in Europe. And she was also known as the Iron Lady. Number three is Indira Gandhi. Uh, she was one of the uh, one and only female prime minister of India. Next is uh, Rosa Parks. She was an African-American. And uh, she was actually challenged for her race, but she came out of it and she stood and she won the civil rights movement in 1960. Florence Nightingale, she was a lady for pioneering of the pioneering of nursing and also reform of the hospital. Now, these are the achievers of the past. Now, let's look into the achievers of the present. Now, these both achievers of the present, actually, it was taken from Forbes magazine. It was a survey held, held by Forbes magazine. Now, here, if we see, the rank, the uh, how they found out that these were the top women achievers is they had four metrics. One was their impact on the world. One was their spheres of insula, uh, influence. One was the media mentions, and one was the power that they had. So here, if you see, I have just taken a very few. There are hundred plus. I have taken very very few. Now to start with, Dr. Zeti Aziz. Uh, she is the governor of the Malaysian Central Bank. And as the longest serving governor of bank of uh, Bank Negara, Malaysia. Uh, number two, if you see in the image, is Christine Lagarde. She is the president of the European Central Bank. Three is Kamala David Harris. You know that she's a current vice president. Number four of United States, I'm sorry. Number four is uh, Ursula. Uh, she is a German politician and uh, she has been the president of the European Commission since 1st December 2019. And in the fifth, you can see Nora. She is from UAE and actually uh, she has been selected in April 2021 to train as the NASA astronaut. And in the last part, you can see Malala, you know, she's the Pakistani activist. Now, apart from that, I have just mentioned two other people. One is Geeta Gopinath, an Indian, but she is there as the chief economist in IMF. And Indra Nui, she is the CEO of PepsiCo. And why I had mentioned Indra Nui is because as per Forbes survey 2020, she is the 13th most powerful woman in the world. Now, all this is done to get the sustainable development. So let's get into the sustainable development goals. Now, this was defined in 2015 and there are 17 sustainable goals, but we will get into two main goals, goal number five and goal number 10, where goal number five says gender equality and goal number 10 is reduced inequalities. Now, if you see role number, uh, SDG 5, gender equality, you can see here that numericals and alphabets. Okay. Now, what are these numericals? The numerical 1 to 6, 5.1 to 5.6, this is the outcome, outcome targets. And if you see ABC, 5ABC, these are the means of implementation targets. So, SDG 5 had 9 targets and 14 indicators. But we will be going specifically only into uh, three or four of these targets, which would be explained uh, when the relationship is being explained between five and ten. Now, this is SDG 10, where it is reduced inequalities. Now, here, the numericals 10.1 to 10.7 is the outcome targets and 10.8 to 10.C is the means of achievements. Now, what we will be focusing more is 10.2. 10.3 and 10.4, which is related to the gender equality. So here, let's see about the relationship. As I said, the SDG 5 and the SDG 10. 
So here, what we are trying to see here is the relationship between SDG 5 and SDG 10. Now, this shows that. <clears throat> so here, this includes gender equality, anti-racism, and it is seen to it that the more we give gender equality, for example, in terms of governance or whatever, more the woman is being employed. We are reaching to the target of SDG 2030, but somewhere we are going down because in terms of the uh, economic equality. So here, such complexities we are trying to address between these uh, SDG 5 and SDG 10. So the discrimination between the ladies and gents to eliminate the inequality depending on the developed and the developing countries, this is what they're trying to achieve. Now, how do we achieve this? So there are four pillars for gender equal cities to achieve the gender equal cities. In this, the four pillars are intersectionality, multi-level governance, integration of uh, hard and soft measures, working with civil society and gender ex experts. Now, what do we mean by intersectionality? Intersectionality is this, this is meaning you don't segregate a person in terms of race, gender, sexual class, whatever. That is first thing. Second thing is hard and soft measures, meaning the built environment to the cultural and social and uh, the uh, skill development. We need to integrate multi-level governances. You need to have ladies in all levels, city level, policy level, planning, everywhere ladies need to be there. And then working with civil society and gender experts is bringing in ladies uh, to work with men as actually it can be as part of associations or even NGOs as part of planning that this needs to get in. Now, apart from that, to have a gender equal city, what are the measures? There are 10 measures. So here it is work, which says that means 50, 50 representation to check that the equality is given to all the citizens to use that is the city's leverage to promote gender equality to create public safe spaces with are safe and healthy for both male and female mainstream that is gender across all the departments narrow the pay gap commit that is have participation communication and representation of the gen of male and female collect proper data uh, then the ninth one is protect, protect the services of women and men so that there is no gender based violence. And last is to sign the European Charter for Equality for Women and Men in Local Life. So these are the 10 measures to start a gender equal city in future. So finally, I would wind up my session by saying gender equal cities shows how creating space for women's voices needs and capacities is a necessary step towards building thriving cities. Thank you. And, um, thank you, Professor Gayatri Biswanathan. Um, that's an interesting sharing about gender equality that um, allow equal access between men and women to aspects um, such as education and health, as well as architecture, and looking at its measures and benefits in promoting safer and healthier cities and planning through SDG. Okay, um, so we shall move to our second speaker, Dr. Sharifah Salwa Said Mahza, will be sharing um, about space syntax and the development of architecture studio with evidence-based design decision methods. So uh, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Sharifah Salwa to start the session. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Hello, 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 everyone. <laughs> hello. Can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Oh no. Yes, all good, Dr. Sharifa. Okay, all right. Okay, we see that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator, Dr. Israel, uh, Dr. Ellis, for well, having well, me as well as one of the speakers, and uh, our esteemed colleagues from SASI as well as from. Uh, 
was that Creative School Design Sasi Creative School of Architecture as well as the Lohr Institute of Technology India. Okay. I'm hoping, nevertheless, um, and of course, my uh, this honorable speakers from uh, the two college, uh, two colleges in India, as well as my counter, my colleague, uh, architect Samsi as well. Um, I hope I am not going to disappoint in terms of the uh, how to say, in terms of the focus of the um, talk today. Um, it is on housing. Yeah, I just got to know that a little bit, but I do have a little bit on housing. But uh, let me just uh, uh, first introduce myself. I am Sharifa Salva Said Mahdar, and I got my PhD from the Bartlett UCL. And my topic today is actually space impacts and the development of architecture studio with evidence based design decision methods. Most of my work actually very much into methodology kind of based which is actually space in tax. And I believe there are colleagues as well, possibly SASI as well as a VIT, who are also using the space in tax and really look forward to work together in the future. Okay. Can you see my slide, yeah? All good? Yes, um, Dr. Sharifa, do you mind to um, uh, scale up a bit your, your presentation? Scale up how, yeah? <laughs> I do not know how to scale up. <laughs> um, scale up. Perhaps you can change to the slideshow. Is is it is on the slideshow now? Is it? Is it? Is it oh. on? It's on the slideshow currently, actually, to be honest. But is it small? Yeah. It's a bit uh, small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What am I gonna do? Uh, what you can do is for you to. It's click not there. in presentation mode. You have to go into presentation mode. Presentation mode at the at at the bottom uh, right hand corner of the presentation. A sharing presentation mode. Share content. Participants may share. Already share it. Already it's the share. button on the bottom right by the scale bar, the rightmost button. Beside the scale bar on the right, lower right. The scale bar on the lower because actually the problem what I'm seeing here is not the same as what you see there. Let me just see how it is. <laughs> so you have to re reshare, I guess. I have to reshare. Okay, I'll stop sharing and I'll reshare. Hold on. How am I going to sh stop sharing? So I'm not used to uh, how to say this. Uh, Rebacks actually. Mm. So you're not really showing, um, it's just, sorry for this, uh, how to say, some technical issues. Um, what gonna do? One minute, yeah? Just give me one minute. Um, I have tried to, am I sharing my content or how is it? Right now we're seeing your, your uh, slideshow in, in um, with the menu on the left uh, as thumbnails and, um, you know, just the workings, the working format. You, are you, you, uh, I don't use WebEx, so I'm not sure exactly how it works, but you need to put the um, one way to do it is save it as a PDF and just show the PDF. That's a short yeah. one. I think I got it. I think I got it. Hold on a minute. I think I got it. Um, if it's PDF, probably it doesn't really do what, what I want it to do. Hold on a minute. So is it okay now? Yes. No. Yeah. It's, it's not still not okay. I already it's have it the on the presentation slides, actually. Still the is same. It okay? Still the same? Ooh. Maybe we should move on to the next presenter. <laughs> Let me just try again. I do not know why, why it's not doing what it needs to do. Okay. Anyway, um, so what, what do you see actually currently?
or we see the uh, the working mode, you know, with the thumbnails on the left. You see the working mode. With the thumbnails on the left, a slide in the middle and a huge That's menu on top. Right. Can I share my slide with you and you do it for me? Is that okay? Yeah, sure, sure. That's, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share my slide with Dr. Isra and probably, hopefully, she will reshare it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry for a bit of a screen. I'll share you via because it's actually quite quite a big, um, big, uh, let me see, big farm. Mm -hmm. Technical, technical. I already shared with her via the Google Slides, and I hope it won't take too long for Dr. Isra to download. And perhaps she can help me sharing the thing, the, what they call it, my slides. Yeah, bear with me. <laughs> the technical thing. Okay. Shall I stop sharing? Dr. Zira, I have already stopped sharing. Can you right, one moment, yeah? You want me to share? Are you okay? Possible? Still opening. <laughs> I think the file is quite big. It's, it's actually very big. So it's a problem. Um, if you don't mind, I can go first while you try to resolve the technical issue. It's, it's coming probably another two, three okay. minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, I think yeah, it's opening now. It's opening. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So the next one. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, sorry about that. Apology, much apology. So we'll continue. Uh, I'll be very quick. So uh, just next slide. Next slide. Next. Yeah, okay. So basically, just sharing session, like I said, split syntax, my work, a lot of my work based on the methodology oriented in yeah, using split syntax. Uh, so what is space syntax? So roughly the structure of my presentation today is actually on the what is space syntax studio, a bit of work, process of design development within our studio, uh, application into urban analysis, into application it into architecture external external, a little bit on housing for the low income population studies that are done on the spatial and social analysis, strength and limitation of the methodology that we use, as well as some references next. Right, so aim, yeah, next. Okay, so the aim of the, uh, the vision is always about, I always uh, trying to say about my vision on the work that we've been doing, it's always about this pan pandemic experience has brought us a lot into having to really um, brush ourselves, upskill our knowledge into this uh, digital experience, yeah? And that is actually being brought into our profession as well. Okay, next. 
So our aim next aim is just to expose and sharing session in order to strengthen the relation intertwined between the intangible and tangible properties of the built environment. So my take is always about research and design, trying to link up the academy and industry. Okay, next. So my pedagogy in architecture, as I mentioned to many, many of my students, like I said, my work is very much into this um, methodology oriented work. Yeah, architecture is hard to me and I always tell my students it's okay to be lost. With that, I venture into the space syntax methodology in order to help me to visualize space. Yeah? Okay, next. So what is space syntax? The theory and the method. Space syntax is actually from Bill Saylor next, is a science-based human-centered, yeah, human-centered uh, analysis. Next, Dr. Isura, can you hear me? Yeah, a science-based human-centered, a simple word. But what it is, is this configuration, architecture and urban design to Professor Bill Hiller, the founder, both in their formal and spatial aspects as are seen as fundamentally configuration simply means there are network of relation between space, one space to another, between the local and the global context of network. Okay, next. Next. I'll be very quick because I don't want to take people's time. So for me, the study on the space syntax is about phenomena of network of things. Yeah. So it started probably a long time ago and it's becoming more and more um, uh, relevant and obvious these days. Okay, and um, spaces for the for the space syntax theory and method uh, is always cut was down to the to the fact that spaces can be broken down into components, yeah, analyzed as networks of choices, visibility, and those are all the spatial variables being represented as maps and graphs. And through the connected through realizing the connectivity and integration of spaces. Next. Okay, three conception of the uh, space syntax, as many have known. Uh, the first picture was about people move linearly. The second picture is about people interact in convex space. The third picture is about people experience space. That is I saw this. Yeah. So these are three fundamental concepts of space syntax. Next. So when space syntax analysis, as Prof uh, earlier mentioned, yeah, about gender equality. So space syntax have been used a lot in this kind of analysis as well in terms of patterns, realizing the patterns of movement, urban growth, of course, gender equality, safety and crime distribution definitely relate to gender on cities as well as building contacts. Next. So these are just very two, very, uh, how to say, very general uh, uh, with reference to Late Professor Mill Hiller, uh, the studies on the Tate Gallery using visual graph integration analysis using space syntax, uh, realizing the space, how people move. The first, the, the, the picture on the left is actually tracing the pedestrian movement or people's movement. The picture on the right is actually the spatial data in relation to the movement that is actually being observed. So that's how the comparison is made. So space syntax allow us to see the pattern of movement on the left as well as the, the, the computer simulation on the right, telling the same thing, describing the same thing, what is happening, happening on the site. Next. So in our architecture space uh, studio, next please. In our architecture studio, uh, it's been about 10 years now since we inculcate the work on the space and tax the methodology. So it's about becoming an organic growth amongst the students. So there's only like four examples here amongst, uh, apart from any other examples in time, probably I can show more. Uh, so it's growing. So these are all the interpretation based on the space and tax analysis. Next. So in our case, how does the space syntax help the design thinking in our case, and how do we relate theory to practice? Yeah. So we always uh, ask this question when we have some kind of work scheme for the students to work on in the studio. Next. Next. Okay. Application into urban analysis. This one I will just go very very quickly uh, into urban analysis. Yes. Next. 
Okay, spatial natural analysis, our case studies, in this case is Kuala Lumpur, and I hope um, counterparts, colleagues from India have been to Malaysia, or if not, you're welcome, and hopefully you will see our Kuala Lumpur city center, and we have very beautiful uh, twin Petronas tower, currently still the highest building in Malaysia, soon it's not going to be, yeah. So anyway, this is our, this is our study, next. Yes, next. Jalan Ampang is our main street. So this is just a gift on the how we realize the contextual analysis using uh, axial, axial analysis, contextual analysis within the radius, five kilometer radius of Kuala Lumpur city center. Okay, next. Yeah, so this is just a very overview. Uh, the Kampung Baru on the left, and the Kuala Lumpur City Center Petronas Tower on right. So there's always this contradict of uh, uh, how to say uh, of of uh, contextual analysis in terms of uh, pedestrian movement, into not just pedestrian, the social movement activities, retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, within the context of the spatial analysis. Next. Next. Okay. So basically, axial line analysis from the urban analysis using space syntax, we can also uh, identify the streets or the patterns of the streets that are actually highly integrated or segregated. Okay, next. Yes, okay. So the morphology of the structure of the case study that we are doing is actually on Jalan Ampang in front of the Polar Lumpur City Center. Next. Sorry, Dr. Zero. <laughs> I have to go a bit fast. So this is just the very basic morphology of the archival materials of the KLCC vicinity. Okay, next. And this is the current status. Next. And then we apply space syntax analysis, axial line to, to the left, 1957, Dalan Anpang, if you can see the red one, the very red strip is actually having the high integration value and to the right line having the lower integration is the same strip. Yeah, meaning that, uh, meaning that the, the potential and the connectivity in the old days when it was important being diluted, being, being erased when, with a new development, yeah? something like that. Next. Okay, this is just telling what, what I mentioned earlier. Next. So how can we adopt this one? Uh, I have my vision into making our streets always uh, about important streets to be to to, ha to 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 see how it can be more meaningful and more meaningful to the presence to the role it has to serve within the context. Okay, next. And in our analysis, we also use uh, space and tax is very much a spatial how do you put Spatial configurative, yeah, configurative, configurative uh, variables. But we also need to integrate it, the analysis with the integration with the non configurative variables, such as static activities, simply means the way people sit, talk, and watch along the street. So we map them up as well. So we relate them and we do the, uh, the analysis accordingly. Next. Next. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So these are some of the analysis that we have done. Yeah, go ahead. Just next, because I want to show the the analysis on the visual graph measure. So the static activities we also follow people on this non-configurative analysis. Next, yeah. So we identify from the axial analysis when we do the on the context we identify public spaces we map them out. Next. Yes, we identify the buffer spaces next. And we layer with the space syntax axial analysis next. Then we can visualize them 3D. This is just some of the different next. Right, okay, this is some kind of the interpretation that we did in our class for the uh, Kuala Lumpur City Center. You can see the very, very roundabout in the middle. This is our interpretation on how to improve the street structure as well as the context. Next. So into the application, into the architectural design process. Next. 
Uh, this is uh, one of the case studies, one of the work that we've done, spatial visibility of vertical spaces, we call it. Uh, we try to see how high the building can be, the scheme can be, and so we use uh, the axial analysis as well as visual graph analysis into making our form making, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, next. All right, so of course the framework of analysis has to be there. Next. So these are the process that we've done uh, relating the space impact analysis to the building uh, formation. Next. Again, the process number one, axial map analysis. Number two, representation of spaces through the segment map and axial map. Number three, we do, we analyze, we uh, explore the spatial form potentials. And then number four, we interpret it, we interpret it into the model of regression analysis, and then we're testing the formation again. Next. Yeah, just go ahead. This one, I'm just going to browse them. Yeah, you don't want to take too much time. Okay, it's always about relating the global network to the local network into the analysis of space impacts. Okay, next. Yeah, so we can find out, we can determine, identify the value of every street network that we are analyzing. Next. Yeah, so this is the interpretation, the right one, uh, the left one is just the, uh, the Google map and the right one is the visual graph analysis. We can see when the high, when the red one is actually most dense area, when the blue ones are segregated area, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Yeah, so in architecture, uh, visibility graph analysis plays a very, very important role, even uh, amongst our students at the same time. Next. Okay, so we relate all these analyses to the, uh, to the uh, variables, to the, to the value of the integration value of every street network. Next. Yes. Next. These are the samples. Yes, and then we analyze them accordingly. Next, the time span, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this one I'm just going to go very, very briefly, very, very quickly. Okay, Zero. Very good. Yeah, Kampung Baru, uh, one of our, the next of our case studies, Kampung Baru is uh, the famous urban village. Hopefully, it's not the last one in Kuala Lumpur, but hope, yeah, we, we also study in terms of the spatial network analysis and to bring out the spirit of the Kampung Baru itself, so that it will not be disturbed. Next. Yeah, so we compare the contextual analysis through visual analysis, and we found as well on Kampung Baru in Kampung Baru itself, uh, is, is Kampung Baru is an urban village, so the, the amount of cars uh, we want to see whether we question whether we want to have the big amount of cars there or or not. So these are the questions we always ask when we do the, our analysis, whether we should really have a lot of cars in a small village or not. I mean, for generally, we, we may say no, but how are we going to prove that? So through space impact analysis, at least we have some evidence to argue of the point that we're trying to make. Next. Next. Okay. So this is one of the architecture interpretation into the urban village. We making we design you know, propose a deaf the music center for the deaf, yeah. Next, okay. Just go ahead. The question here is actually how are we going to relate the deaf? How are we going to make the space to be audible for the deaf? So the deaf is actually very, very, very sensitive, very, very good in terms of their, their visual capacity. So how are we going to interpret into our space interpretation as well as the form making? Next. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, next, Dr. Zira. <laughs> yes, the Hilsa Studio, we analyze all this. Next, through visual graph analysis, next. Yes. This is the software. Next, another one is actually on the. We have a very important river as well. 
So we study the uh, the context, the river, on how we're going to maintain, uh, man how to uh, regenerate the river within the urban village of Kampung Baru itself as well. Yeah, next. Yes, this is the interpretation of architecture interpre interpretation of the area that we are studying. Next. Yes, we create shortcuts when necessary in order to enhance the, the movement pattern, the pedestrian use of the spaces. Next. Yes, go ahead. Next. <laughs> just going to browse this. Yes. Yeah, these are just the process using the visual graph analysis. Next. Like I said, I'm quite a methodology oriented kind of person. Next. So these are all just to show you very, very briefly the method. Next. Computer simulation using the space impacts analysis. Next. So we study study the space arrangement and all that. So we do a lot of testings in this case. Next. Yes, next. Main entrance, main entrance. We do the correlation analysis. This is part of the research. Next. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, yes. Dominant feature, how are we going to establish the entrances, etc., etc. So we use this method. Next. How many more have got? <laughs> Next. Yeah, integration globally. Next. Yeah, next one. It's okay. So it's actually on circulation connectivity and the uh, points movement. Yeah, core placement of the area. So we use all this analysis. So next, so a little bit on housing uh, analysis, housing housing studies for the low income population, relation spatial and social actually, and static activities as non conjugated variables on military traditional houses using VGA overview. Okay, next, next one. So, okay, this is the scenario of Malaysia, low income population, something that we have done. The scenario from the 1970s and it comes to now it is 1990s, 2014, demolition, demolition started to happen. Uh, two bedroom scheme came in and then uh, when it comes to the terrace houses, completely renovated and all that. So, we, we, we saw this uh, scenario housing development of Malaysia for the low income population. Next. So we study uh, the layout using visual graph analysis. As you can see, the original layout on the left on the uh, so the terrace housing as well as apartment housing. So the below one is a terrace housing, the original layout. So we study the uh, the uh, visual integration using visual graph analysis, and we see when the place when the space becoming renovated, that it becomes is the the changes of color of the density. Uh, of of the openness is actually changing, so that is actually why people people change people people uh, people basically renovate their houses mainly, yeah, because the, the, because in terms of space impacts there is depth. Let's say it's a shallow design as well as depth design. So that's that's how we, we analyze it. Okay, next. Okay, so this is also the major problem that uh, domestic space for the low, low income houses are always limited, yeah. So, and they have a lot of the static activities, uh, their own activities that needs to be accommodated, which is actually not able to. Okay, next. And so basically in terms of our work, we relate the non-configurative variables, which is static activities and the visual graph analysis. We compare to the way Malay traditional houses are being laid out. So we postulate, we propose, to use this Malay traditional houses concept as an ideal home design for the low income population of Malaysia. Next. Yeah, so this is a very general one as well. We or, or we also analyze a few of the many, many, many actually uh, of the Malay traditional houses to see how many of these density, how many of these uh, red spots can be happen, how efficient the space are. So 2016, we found out the, there are three concepts of uh, Malay traditional houses having uh, three concepts of uh, space, as we call it as a 
three special home structure properties being embedded into Malay traditional houses, and then we discover the genotype of Malay traditional houses. So we're trying to advocate to bring this into the design of the low income group uh, population housing land. Next. Yeah, okay, I don't think I'm going to go much, but of course there is strength and limitation into the uh, work. Yes, on the space and tech analysis, uh, most, uh, I think one is actually quite notable, quite very obvious is on the, um, how to say, is on the parameter, next, 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 one, on the parameter of analysis is actually lots of, uh, lots of, I would say, uh, try and error and testing needs to be done and for architecture students. And these are actually not very, very familiar to them. Yeah, uh, using space, using these uh, spatial data simulation as well as a statistic. So that's a little limitation, but we're still working on it. Okay, next. Yeah, yeah, the process of the visual graph analysis is actually one of the most very important uh, tools students will use yeah, in their design uh, decision making. Next. Yeah. Never mind, this one conclusion. Next. As I mentioned earlier, spatial design tools, visual graph analysis being used as a favorite tools to use by the students. Next. Next. Never mind, I think the takeaways. Uh, I always try to advocate to the students research and design. We have to integrate research and design and as we all know, we have to strengthen the relation between academic and industry. And I told my students as well, we have to trust and believe in research and how we can convince others through using the space impacts analysis. Next. Yeah, references. Next. My references. <laughs> Next. Okay, thank you. And I have the last one, which is actually a video. Uh, two minutes, I think. If not, then uh, thank you so much. And I'm sorry to take so much time <laughs> for the technical issue. Uh, maybe you can play this for a bit. This is a visual graph analysis using this, uh, uh, how to say, uh, agent simulation for the spaces that we have designed. So we have to go through, we have to, how to say, to run this analysis as well. This is the finished work, but before coming to this, a lot of work that is actually being done in order to support our decision. Okay, with that, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, um, thank you very much, Dr. Shajifah Salwa, for an insightful talk about space syntax methodology as part of the learning, uh, teaching and learning in architecture, uh, looking at how space influences human behavior and movement, and uh, the way space syntax being used in helping students in their design thinking and process. That's very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Salwa. Um, and now, um, I would like to invite our third speaker, Professor Minakshi Papu from Bello Institute of Technology, who will be talking about ameliorating urban housing. The room is yours. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Professor. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you. I shall share my presentation. Hope my presentation is visible. 
Yes, I can see your presentation now. And it's it's in a slide mode. Yeah, thank you. No, it's in presentation mode now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's good afternoon from India and very good evening, Malaysia. Um, as my topic says, I'm going to talk about urban housing, which is the need of the, our discussion happening on the global platform. Um, as uh, everybody is talking about how well our urban housing uh, need to be designed and how different uh, fields integration is happening and discussions are happening between wide uh, networking. So I'll start with a little bit background about Indian uh, cultural heritage. Um, it's as a wide variety. Um, so Indian cultural heritage has developed, has an space where we live, where we grow, how we live, what we eat, what we celebrate. So it's all about which geographical location we are in and how a different geographical location actually modified a human settlement and how we evolved from the nature was all about, and I'm talking about generation would have seen, uh, who were born in 1970s and 1980 would have seen that and how the development actually took over and how urbanization actually um, affected or you can see intervene in the way we lived and how how we were detached from the culture traditional housing this is a few snapshots uh, to the world just to show the, the diversity of different uh, geographical terrains in india and how different geographical terrains actually shaped our live or built environment and how our lifestyle was so close to nature, how what we take from the nature was given back to the nature in different form. A little bit of glimpse uh, I just want to add here. Uh, if suppose you are, uh, you live in a heavy uh, rainfall area, so you had very sloped roofs. And suppose you live in an area where you have a lot of wood available. So your lot of elements in your built environment were made for wood. Uh, if it's cold along with rainy, so you had very small openings towards the exteriors. Uh, if you have heavy rainfalls, which rainfall actually comes with some pressure in a hilly area, so you, you had a raised houses. So depending upon the type of uh, the location we were, our houses are designed to facilitate or to commemorate the, the nature itself. You take uh, in nature, from nature, and you give back. For the small example, uh, you have uh, you we used to eat on the floor with the with the banana leaf. So banana leaf is again given to the cattle which are in the house which eat them, and the cow dung which is produced is being dried and used as a fire root. The ash from the fireplace actually used to clean the vessels. So the way forms change, the waste is never, there was never waste in the cultural way of living, the traditional way of living in India. So, but the recent floods that you have seen all over the, the climatic change that is happening, the type of disasters that we see in last 15, 20, 20 years now, it's very obvious that there's something seriously wrong happening with the way we lived and the way we adopted it. I read recently in one of the papers that stated that in 1900, Chennai had around 500 plus lakes. So it was a city which known how to survive or how to preserve water and how it actually grown. And the recent study two years back in 2019, the number of count of lakes have come down drastically to 40 plus. And then whenever there is an issue like an had a natural disaster that hits of any of the urban spaces, we start rethinking what actually going wrong and what actually to be done. I think it's like we are not anticipating what is actually going to come. We, we need to think 
our actions and their, their repercussions that are going to act on a human um, settlement itself. So this is a small example of how Chennai was in just 70 years back, and then how it actually changed the land terrain and how the depreciation of the agriculture and the green spaces actually came up. So what are our cities right now? We have a lot of um, urban sprawls at the fringes and traditional housing is a lot of compromises has happened. We see a lot of long, high rise towers everywhere and the need of uh, economic weaker section buildings has increased. The infrastructure comes after the, set, the, the human settlers are already reached the point. The effects of uh, climate change are seen. We see that there is a periphery that is created around our cities which actually define the boundaries. And a lot of uh, surrounding land masses, the fringes are actually taken into city over the period of time. The quality of water, air, and food is actually coming down. The soil degradation is happening. So this is what we are seeing right now. So where are we have started and where did we land? This is what we are thinking. So this is what we were. So we had a site, we had a proper open spaces, we had floors, we had kitchen opening onto a uh, kitchen garden or dairy farm. Then we had proper washing space, naturally lit ventilation where our daily routine used to start with the sunrise and complete by the sunset. And how well we used to plan our date time where a little bit of hint how the society is for. We are agriculture based society. And how the agriculture based societies transformed itself with people who had skill also had agriculture as a background. Suppose I'm talking about a carpenter. A carpenter still owned or did farming to a certain time. If I'm talking to Potter, Potter also did farming. So this additional skill set which we had to support a society. The weaver used to farm, the, <laughs> the mason used to farm. So there are there is no particular division of saying, okay, this profession is related to certain community. So our system was so well intact where we actually were self-sufficient. All our settlers are self-sufficient. And there was the word waste or living close to nature was not a coin to be tossed at our societies. We were in nature. We were living in line with nature. We were not segregated. The materials that we used are from the where we lived. If you're using mud as your uh, major material to build, that means you are in a flat terrain where you need walls where you can actually support and let the outer heat outside and keep the inners cooler. So we were with the nature. So once the house is dismantled, you can actually reuse every part of the house. And so there's no word waste. And there is a word called sustainability, which we are talking so much in the present era. So there were different spaces, both public space, private spaces, and also there were semi-public spaces in the house. So there were a lot of multifunctional spaces. And I want to add one more important point here because we all talk about furniture, indoor designing spaces. I always try to go back and check why we never seen uh, a designated dining space, designated bedrooms, why these spaces are never uh, seen in a, a traditional housing. Then we realized that kitchen was not only a kitchen, kitchen was also a dining space. Kitchen was also a place where um, the preparation for the food, preparation for the medical herbs were created, where there were spaces within the house where they used to weave, the places where they used to transform the waste or the byproducts of the house into some other elements which can be used by the kids. So suppose you have a coconut tree in the house. The coconut tree is actually used to support for everything from the coconut water to the coconut to the coconut shell, the fiber about it, everything was used within the house. The fiber was transformed into doormats, wall curtains, hangers, everything it is used. So a coconut tree in the house is actually supporting the family in so many ways. So there is no, um, what is the waste that is produced and which actually uh, what most sustainable houses you could ever hear. So what's happening now in the urban houses? To get away from the heat, we try to do whitewash on the roof. 
because we are connected to our roots so we trying to give a small micro garden in the house we trying to create small garden spaces which can get shade we try to incorporate solar panels on the roof to have to tell ourselves no we are still doing something to good for the nature uh, this small interventions that we are trying to adopt in medium and even the urban areas the small case study that uh, been done in the city called Surat, where we saw how the rising temperature of Surat city actually um, affected the livelihood of a common man. This uh, Surat was affected with very heavy um, heat waves and it went up to 54 degrees Celsius, which is very high. And there were deaths due to this. So at the time they realized that the, there is something seriously wrong happening the way we are living. So then a vulnerability test was done to identify which are the parts of the city which are badly affected. And they actually understood that when every city is different, we can't have an uniform way of planning. And they also understood the need to understand how the locality works what is happening at the lower grassroots levels so they told the problem can be global but we should understand how at root level we are actually can address the situation so they started readdressing all these elements by providing different types of parameters i'll get back to that but meanwhile i also want to address one more major parameter can be seen in an urban area so is that we also understand that there are a lot of measures that bring up by the governments to uh, support the urban poor, they quote it, urban poor or the slum areas, which were, they say they bring up a lot of health uh, measures, starting from natural health policy missions and health training institutions, factors that concern increase to uh, or increase the awareness of people how to take care of the health. Like, where are when we compare with the traditional housing with these slums, <laughs> I we actually missing the major parameter that is called something called uh, the the connect between the nature and the human being. Instead of connecting the human being to a nature, we try to bring in a lot of policy which are only the um, out of film of any problem. We are not actually understanding the actual core issue of any type of housing. So there are a lot of issues that are spoken. So there are something called resilience, which is widely spoken or discussed or debated in the recent times. And sustainability is the word which the whole world is talking about. So now what is the resilience is all about? So when you talk about disasters, disasters are man-made and also natural occurring disasters are there. I want to importantly highlight one point here. We, we, everybody is talking about climate change is happening. So we are in the prone of the climate change um, and we are seeing it, it is happening right now. And uh, we read a lot of articles on this basis. Uh, there is a study recently by a historian who actually connected this climatical change in the last 5,000 years. He also said in his research that this climate change is happening every repeating itself for every 450 to 500 years. Unfortunately, this time the circle has actually moved ahead. He said now we are seeing a climate change less than 450 years. And this is only because of the type of life, life type of uh, built environment that we, have, that we have given to the nature. And the nature is showing its repercussions regarding the way we have treated it. So it's actually giving back to us. So in this scenario, so what should we do right now is the question everybody is asking themselves right now. So as we were talking about resilience, the resilience is nothing but we need to anticipate the forthcoming disasters and be prepared for that is nothing but the resilience. Sustainability is actually the equilibrium between the time and the space. So we need to understand that the ideas and the resource management is much more critical in this system the biosystem itself. So the resilience and sustainability are actually the two are the same, uh, they're the two sides of the same coin. So we need to talk about starting from 
social to the ecosystem problems in the more potential and dependent on one another. So quickly, I'll just move towards major parameters of core uh, resilience, social, economic governance, and environmental resilience. So in social uh, resilience, I'm quickly going to give through some statistics, which actually uh, Gayatri Mama has actually given a little brief, but I'll put a little bit more on how the social resilience is actually affecting and why is it is important. So from the demographic graph, we, have, we can see that the um, birth rate is actually coming down and life expectations is actually increasing. And the population which are below 60 years in India is quite less. And we also seen that the gender variation has been increasing over the years to come. We have seen that and I'll, I'll come back why we need this data and how is it relevant to our uh, present study of urban housing. As Gayatri Ram rightly said, until and unless we take into consideration the two uh, both the genders into parameters, there are few things can few things that cannot be addressed. Like ma'am said one of your examples, how the uh, neighborhood has been changed after they had done female participation or taken their opinion into consideration. So <clears throat> is uh, is the gender only important? Is something called happiness index that usually come up in the global platform whenever we discuss? Is uh, happiness a separate entity? Is it part of a life? It's part of a life. And globally, we have a certain parameters like uh, GDP, then social support, health, life expectancy, freedom to make life choice. So there are certain parameters under which uh, happy index has been uh, calculated. Uh, unfortunately, India is far uh, away from to cross to nowhere close to Finland or Denmark. Uh, but uh, I checked right before uh, preparing this presentation. I actually asked my grandfather that, um, were you happy when you were in? He said, we never known what to separate happiness is all about. We are with family, we are happy. We do work, come back, rest. And we only used to work six months a year. Six months we're actually idle. And we used to do all types of handwork with friends, roam around, connect with the nature. We used to clean roads, we used to maintain our society. Making a society, working with society is what used to make us happy. And we don't even know what the your people work for five days a week and two days you have holidays. And Saturday, Sunday, now your um, uh, work from home made your 24 by 7. We don't even know what you're talking about. So the transformation of society is entirely different the parameters does the parameter define happiness index okay i that we need to recheck on that okay uh, so i'm saying that every society is different the different indexes can't be happening but when talking global platform that actually like, talks about a different parameters altogether so there's an economic uh, resilience this is important because uh, as a taxpayers we all pay tax and our tax money is expected to be used in developing the infrastructure, provide education and health for the people. So in India, um, I just quickly want to give an insight about how unemployment and uh, unorganized sector is actually hindering and how we are seeing it during the lockdown. Um, if you see an Indian uh, poverty rate in last decade, you see that there's 21 percent and unemployment rate is 50 percent. That says that 50 percent of our population is employed, unemployed. But if you see Bihar, it is one or two people out of thousand and in uh, Chhattisgarh, it's 18. Now, OK, come on. Bihar is agriculture based uh, area. Chhattisgarh is, is comes under a forest region with a lot of tribes population is much more higher. So how do you mean that the tribes are more engaged than the farmers in Bihar? Okay, let me clarify this. Tribes do work during two, 365 days. Whenever they want food, they go into forest, fetch it, come back and survive. So does we call them employed? The farmer who goes to work under a landlord, 
if it doesn't have a work, then we call them the unemployed population. So you see the variation, the, the way we're looking at parameters is actually entirely different. So uh, when we talk about wealth equality, so in on a global platform, we can see that India is says that the top one person of uh, population is is actually wealthier, the top ten one person. So, and when we come to individual, um, this is started within India in last uh, 60, 70 years. We see that the population, which is be below 50% uh, in India has been reducing, it's not increasing. So does the poverty exist? Does people don't have money in hand? Okay, let us think on that. Okay, uh, before I come back quickly to the environmental parameters, the on a global scale, it, it shows that India's population around 30% is living in slums. Slum, where are the slums located? The slums are located in the major cities. And what is happening in the cities? What are the population doing in cities? In population, if you see the population in rural and urban population, the literacy rate in urban areas is much more higher. The death rate in urban areas is much more higher, uh, sorry, lower. And the mortality rate in urban areas is lesser. Then if everything is good in urban areas, how come we have 30% of slums in India? So this is a literary, uh, literary uh, um, scientific showing how the literacy rate between male and female. We also can see that the gap is coming down and is actually going in a good direction. Coming to the per capita income for every state, as I rightly, rightly said just now that uh, the taxpayers' money need to be used to build the infrastructure of that particular state. The highest, wealthiest person lives in Maharashtra, which is in Mumbai. Sorry, um, Mumbai, which is in Maharashtra. Uh, and do we say that Maharashtra is the most wealthiest state? But the tax base of Maharashtra has been used in formal development in UP and Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. So how far is this correct? I'm raising a lot of questions, but I do want to give you some answers before I get into uh, conclusion. So before getting conclusion, I just want to give a little hint of climate change and how the floods are affected. So on a global scale, we see that cyclones, extreme rainfall, heat waves, and increasing temperatures are the things which are everybody is facing. But we can't ignore that there is loss of biodiversity happening, desalination is happening, the rays of sea levels are happening, and we're anticipating by 2050, most of our cities are going to be under sea. And uh, the, recently, there's a paper which actually spoke about the polar bears and the relocation. So what is happening to them? So these are one of the global uh, climatic risks that is actually happening right now as we speak. As uh, Ma'am Bams told that there's a flood effect in Malaysia recently and how things are going bad. So it's, it's like when you see a global par parameter, disasters are hitting some part or the other throughout the year. Yes, this is what this climate change is happening right now. So we need to have a parameter which actually talks about. So when we talk about different challenges and how to address them, we can't ignore the SDGs. So today I'm going to talk about two major SDGs which actually talk about the urban population. Uh, population. So as urban population, as we all know that presently there are 40% uh, of population of uh, population are living in urban areas. Projected data says by another by 2050, we can expect around 80% of population living in urban areas. So the urban population is increasing and the major cities are actually sinking. Why do we say they are sinking? Because there is no space to grow. And the infrastructure development that are happening within the urban areas need to be re re looked upon and what type of focuses can you bring in? So we also talk, we also don't need to talk about uh, the affected uh, climate. We need to talk about the loss of biodiversity. We need to talk about spatial 
uh, constraints, the sports, uh, spatial index ratios that one population is going through. We also need to talk about the, um, the amount of um, risk that happens when, especially when COVID time actually hit the human traffic. We also have seen that uh, we also have seen that the amount of, if suppose I need to quarantine myself in an urban area. So suppose I'm living in Maharashtra. I need to quarantine myself during the lockdown. Where do I quarantine myself? Do my house have a specialized place where I can quarantine myself? So this was the question to be uh, been asked during the lockdown. When it's mostly when the uh, pan pandemic actually affected the urban urban population. And everyone is talking about bringing back green into the houses, and also they were talking about bringing up. Uh, terrace ecosystems, uh, we need to manage forests, we need to replant the trees, how to combat with and how to reverse the forest, uh, the land degradation. And so, and also SDG number 15 also talks about the five P's of sustainable development, the people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. They're all interrelated to one another. No one survives with, without one another. So the role of spatial planning on the local level is very important. The climate resilience and the practices starting from agriculture, reducing greenhouse gases, increasing forest cover, uh, least land use change, and the last but most important, the water management. So when we talk about green, what type of green are we talking here? We need to increase the green plot ratio instead of just planting on the roof terraces. Because in the urban area, when we're going vertical, the amount and size of roofs are less. So we need to find a way to integrate green plot ratio into the urban, urban developing sites. Uh, we have seen a few examples uh, in European countries where they actually did it successfully. But we also read the repercussions of the nature when integrated in the vertical platform what is happening so there are we are still in the process of learning to how to integrate them all together so in uh, in between all the resilience uh, happening and sustainability and so when you talk about how to balance between urban resilience and urban sustainability there is something called passive and active mode that we need to talk about and rational and irrational elements one second, my slide is not moving. One second, please. Something happened. Okay. Um, sorry, Prof. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's um, okay. We have about uh, two more minutes for you. Yeah, I am having two more minutes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the difference between urban resilience and urban sustainability. The urban resilience is a passive process of uh, monitoring and facilitating and maintaining uh, covering of virtual circle between ecosystems and human well-being through the concerned effects under external influencing factors. So when we talk about urban sustainability, we need to make sure that there is an active process which actually synchronizes and integrates co-evolution between the subsystems making the city without compromising the possibilities of development and surrounding areas of contributing the means towards reduction of harmful effects and development of biodiversity. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Professor Minakshi Papu, um, on your sharing in improving urban housing um, in understanding spaces between traditional and modern housing, and also from the environmental parameters that mainly responses to climate resilience and sustainability. Okay, um, we have come to our last speaker of the session today, which is architect Samsia Abdullah, and uh, which she will be presented a topic about needs for social neighborhood space in affordable housing, a case study. So uh, the room is yours, architect Samsia. Thank you. Okay, hi uh, everyone. Uh... All my colleagues, uh, the students, and also, can you hear me? Yes, I can answer. All right, thank you. Um, this, I just continue. Uh, the, the students and also um, 
our uh, friends uh, from uh, Sasi and also uh, Valor. Um, okay, so basically, um, I only have uh, 30 slides and most of them are uh, pictures, so I'll be very quick. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so what I'm presenting or what I'm sharing today is basically part of uh, my research uh, for my PhD uh, titled Interpretation of Neighborhood Social Space, Structure and Intervention in Vertical Affordable Housing in Johor Bahru. Uh, so today is basically uh, my case study on uh, social space. Uh, so basically on the needs of social space in affordable housing. Um, I think I go to slide show. Okay. Perhaps uh, now you can see a bigger uh, view of the slides. Okay. So um, the research is basically uh, uh, the background of the research, I'm sorry about the noise. I think uh, in this area, there are few lorries going, uh, doing the loading and unloading. So you might hear the background noise a bit. Uh, so uh, the basis of the study is basically um, referred to the DASA or the policy of uh, housing uh, in Malaysia, which is uh, DASA Perumahan Negara 20. 2018 to 2025 and also affordable housing uh, 2019 and also uh, housing policy in Johor Iskandar, Malaysia. So um, first we go to the interpretation or definition of uh, affordable housing. Uh, basically, if we refer to UN Habitat 2011, it, uh, defined, it defines uh, affordable housing as a home that meets the basic needs of the people. Uh, and then if you ask RADA, RADA is one of uh, the uh, authorities that actually handle housing in Malaysia. Uh, it says that, I'm sorry, some of the quotes are in Malay. Uh, some of uh, uh, if we ask Reda, the the definition of uh, affordable housing is basically uh, houses that are below uh, the price below three hundred thousand Malaysia ringgit, and uh, also if uh, we ask the uh, United Nation uh, Human Settlement Program two thousand eleven, it says that affordable affordable housing is defined as a house that meets the needs. In terms of quality and location, is affordable and the buyer of the house still has the financial ability to buy his other basic necessities. Yeah. So for me, I think it's very general. And it also leads to because my focus focus of my study is on uh, social space. Yeah. And in Malaysia, basically, um, the focus is more on house ownership. I think everybody knows that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in Malaysia, the perception of whereby if you don't own a, a house, basically you are not there yet. You don't achieve yet. And you are not successful yet. And similar to other countries like China, I was told that, uh, especially in Shanghai, if you don't own a house, basically nobody wants to marry you. It's a guy lah. It's a guy thing. Okay, uh, so it's uh, basically a scale uh, to determine whether you are successful or not, or whether you are eligible or not to get married. Yeah, so uh, in terms of a uh, social space, yeah, basically, uh, since I mentioned just now that the focus is more on housing ownership. Yeah, so the in fact, the previous government actually uh, targeted uh, in uh, providing like uh, 300 uh, units, uh, 300,000 units of houses for uh, affordable housing. And I think up to up till now, uh, they only achieve like one third of uh, the target. And by doing so also, the, the provision is basically uh, the cookie cutter concept. If you have heard that before, is basically one size 
fits all or one design actually forced to be accepted to everybody. So uh, the owners or the buyers uh, interpretation of a, a nice or a, of a, a comfortable housing, a quality housing is not defined. Uh, and then uh, basically since I said I focus on uh, social space, so the interpretation of a social space in affordable housing, if you refer to the policy, is basically um, it is basically interpreted as a public facilities. Yeah, so public facilities as one of the components in affordable housing, uh, and basically no complete interpretation of guideline and guidelines uh, for social space provision, and then it. Uh, has been interpreted uh, literally as uh, facilities, community facilities, uh, as childcare, surau, or the prayer area, or uh, uh, bilik pengurusan jenazah, or the mob for the non-Muslims, uh, depending on the size of population, children playground, and also the community halls. Yeah, so it is all segmented, and it depends on the designer to where to actually place it. Um, so the problem statement is basically um, a recent quantitative research has shown that the typology of affordable housing fails to respond to household demands where current housing designs are cost oriented without considering the social, social spatial impact and uh, neighborhood that can foster well-being and sustainability. Uh, and the current housing design is incapable of responding and addressing social and municipal issues, uh, especially on uh, issues of social cohesion, social and economic empowerment, defensive space and social spatial. Uh, and thirdly, the so social spatial design of existing affordable housing neighborhoods does not take into account the needs of residents and literally address the needs of the planning aspect without creating a user friendly uh, and user uh, sorry a user friendly environment. And also, when I said uh, uh, when we talk about affordable housing in Malaysia, the that there are categorization of uh, the income income group, yeah, the, the categorization of community according to income group, yeah. So it's basically how much you earn monthly, yeah. So basically the categories there's three categories, yeah. So B forty, M forty, and T twenty, yeah. So below forty, uh, bottom forty, medium. 40 and also T20, uh, top 20. So um, basically uh, the, the, the problem uh, or the issues uh, normally uh, relates to the B40s and the M40. Yeah, so for the T20, basically there's no um, housing uh, provision or subsidies or anything because T20 are the, those people who can afford to, you know, uh, go overseas travel they can afford to uh, basically uh, have their own leisure paid leisure times and so on yeah so it's not an issue and they can actually afford luxury homes perhaps if you are actually at t2 level yeah so uh, in this case uh, in relation to uh, housing provision B40 is normally uh, the provision is basically for uh, social housing, uh, PPR, which is meant for the lower income group housing, uh, the uh, poor housing for the poor, and uh, uh, they also call it Rumahan Awam or uh, Rumah Panjang, the long house. The long house concept is, uh, is an old concept. Perhaps now uh, there's no more Roma Panjang. And uh, in fact, uh, just now in, in Dr. Sharifah's slides, uh, you can see uh, the earlier uh, uh, typology of uh, public housing or social housing in Malaysia. Uh, and they actually started with uh, two bedroom units. And after that, it was proven that it's not suitable. Uh, it's not conducive. Uh, for a big family or a normal family, in fact, so they changed to the three bedroom units. Yeah, and also the second one is the M40 or the 
medium 40 yeah uh, that they call affordable housing which i'm focusing on which is the uh, cost about less than 300 thousand uh, before this they uh, set the uh, limits of uh, set the cost up to uh, 200,000 I think 200,000 but uh, there are a feedback from the developers that they cannot meet that price yeah and some of the housing affordable housing schemes that produce are even higher than 200,000 yeah and then the T20 of course uh, bungalows and condominiums yeah So um, I think uh, the other uh, speakers also talk about SDG, Sustainable De Development Goals uh, 2030. So in relation to housing, basically we are talking about uh, the SDG 11, which is Sustainable Cities and Communities, uh, which relates to um, 11.1 which is ensure access safe housing for services and for the social space perhaps refer to 11.7 which is provide access green public spaces and uh, basically 11.3 also talk about enhanced inclusive and sustainable urbanization that's also related to uh, affordable housing and also social uh, interaction and also social space And uh, before I forgot it, actually, I, I, uh, uh, it's interesting to uh, listen to Professor Gayatri because um, actually last month, I also talked about uh, gender, gender equality and gender equity uh, on uh, Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia or Architect Malaysia Association. Um, and to listen to... Uh, talk on uh, housing yeah? uh, is very uh, uplifting and also to see the uh, issues in uh, other countries is also refreshing. Yeah? So uh, basically, uh, since my uh, topic is related to social space, uh, basically social space actually encourage a social interaction. So the definition of social interaction is a social action between two or more individuals, which includes both verbal and non-verbal communication, such as body language. That is put from Jager, uh, 2010. Social interaction is the foundation of community and society, according to Dempsey, 2011, and is a critical factor in achieving a higher level of social sustainability. So basically, if there's no uh, social interaction, there will be no social, uh, th there's no social space, perhaps it's a uh, social interaction will be limited and it's very difficult to achieve social sustainability. Yeah. So among three uh, dimensions of social aspect of sustainability is uh, the social aspect of su sustainability is the hardest to implement because it is the most challenging to define and measure. Yeah. Although the implication of social sustainability vary, the goal is to create attractive and socially successful so uh, societies. Yeah, we tend to uh, sort of like measure everything. Uh, you know, uh, the green building. You know, uh, I mean, the, the happiness index. Yeah, we we like to do that. Yeah. But basically, seeing uh, 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 an attractive uh, and so uh, socially successful co uh, societies, uh, uh, basically, you can actually observe and uh, uh, perceive it. Yeah. And then uh, also the issues here are height and social interaction because I'm dealing with a vertical communities or vertical housing. So basically living high above the ground is the biggest feature of high-rise residential building according to Shan 20, 2004. The height of high-rise residential building is defined as being more than 24 meters. 
uh, which is according to the country's national building code or even more than 100 meters yeah the higher the residents live above the ground the weaker their perception of the ground environment tends to be according to gail uh, 1996 and this is actually supported by uh, lee in 1978 if i'm not mistaken perhaps uh, in the later slide if you can see it um and uh, of course, I'll be talking about case studies. And uh, actually, there are two of the case studies is basically not an affordable housing. They are actually social housing, which is apartment Lembah Subang and also Bangsa, uh, apartment Bukit Pucho. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the case study, which is Bangsa Puri Desa Dato Haja Hasna is, is in Johor Bahru, is actually affordable housing. So the first two was chosen because I want to show the actual or the uh, critical issues uh, relating to the, the housing condition and also the social space itself. And why is social space uh, 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 adequate provision of social space cannot be achieved? Okay, these are the three case studies. I will start with BPR Lembah Subang and then Pansapuri Desa Dato' Haja Hasna and Pansapuri Bukit Puchong. Okay, this is PPR Lembah Subang, uh, which is a social housing. Uh, basically, the provision of play area here or the social space here is basically uh, on the ground floor, whereby they have this uh, green uh, field that is called play area or, or uh, field. Yeah, And it was left for the community on how to use it at first. Yeah, and then the the unit itself, the typical layout of units, of course, there will, uh, there will be like three uh, bedrooms and uh, two bathrooms. Uh, so the main bath, uh, main bedroom will have its own uh, uh, bathroom, and the other rooms, uh, the rest of the house will share one uh, uh, bathroom. And you have kitchen, and sometimes you also have uh, like a, a balcony or you have a backyard uh, next to the kitchen okay so this is how it looks uh, if you look at the picture on the left with the lady in the black you can see that is uh, how the internal space looks like and uh, for those who were born i think in the 70s might know who this lady is uh i think malays lah Mal malaysians lah yeah uh, malaysians born in before or just after 1970s yeah okay uh okay so this is the general scenario of a ppr housing yeah so basically on the left basically all the houses are grilled uh, a grill installed there yeah, at the uh, entrance way for safety uh, but at the same time it doesn't sacrifice the uh, cross ventilation yeah uh, basically most of the time the grill design is uh, typical um, some of them actually go to the extent that uh, it was add on yeah uh, to the extent that uh, it uh, it is designed as a swing uh, grill, swing door grill uh, that sometimes uh, will obstruct the uh, passerby. And the kitchen space, which can only house a small fridge, counter space for food preparation. And uh, you can see at the back there, you, you can see the clothes uh, hanging yeah, because there's no proper, the, the, prop, the, the drying yard, it was uh, meant for drying yard. But at the same time, if you can see, you can look further, the yard space actually turned into cooking area because the kitchen is very small. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the uh, developers' um, brochures, you won't be able to see the uh, layout for the overall floor because uh, most of the time, there was no provision for any social space or any 
uh, space that uh, the, the uh, occupants or the tenants can actually share and, and have a social interaction. And um, if you look at the external view of yard space, where extension of green space made for cooking and drying area, grill was also then installed to prevent thieves from entering the house through yard space. I don't know how thieves going to enter, but that's what they did. Like, perhaps there are precedents uh, which happens before and that makes them install the grill. Or perhaps it's just uh, their insecurity whereby the needs for security grills uh, uh, and let them to install the grill at the outer side. And also you can see also common corridors uh, as blankets and clothes drying area. And uh, you can see that the clothes are uh, hanging or uh, dry from the uh, windows, unique windows area. And common corridors uh, act as a close drying and storage space. Also, sometimes they put bikes, uh, they put uh, like uh, uh, shoe cabinets and so on. Yeah. Uh, so if you can see the width of the corridor is also minimum width according to the uh, uh, our bylaws. Yeah, so the developers won't, uh, are not ready or uh, not willing to uh, spend more money to provide bigger corridors. Uh, not only that, the unit size is uh, small, uh, but also that uh, the outer, outer space is also very restricted. Okay. So um, after the uh, uh, some years uh, pass, uh, actually there are efforts from the NGOs uh, or private companies to actually come and uh, uh, try to uh, rejuvenate the area by providing, you know, a sports field uh, or and a playing field. Uh, and even later on, we can see through other case studies that uh, they uh, basically the the effort from uh, not the developer but from other people, other other institution to actually come down and 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 try to uh, replenish uh, whatever that is lacking. Um, and uh, for this PPR Lembah Subang, there's a second phase uh, being built and this time actually at 35,000 per unit, uh, but uh, equipped with a uh, community hall, uh, sports field, uh, surau uh, or, or prayer area, uh, childcare, parking, shop, management, shop and management office, according to the uh, general uh, guidelines or the uh, the housing policy uh, 2018. And uh, now the second case studies, uh, uh, this is apartment Dato Hasna, this is affordable housing. But what you can see is it's not much different uh, from the uh, social housing or Lembah Subang. Uh, it's just that the difference in the size uh, and plus perhaps they have uh, more uh, uh, yard space attached to it and um, and also yeah the, the unit size is bigger and uh, these are the surrounding area uh, the open car park yeah, and uh, but uh, what I can see is they have a quite uh, adequate number of car parks if compared to uh, Lembah Subang area. Uh, and actually, I have a video on uh, Lembah Subang uh, project, but uh, I I think uh, perhaps later on you just uh, can share the slides or you can play uh, later lah. Okay. Um, and uh, in this apartment, it was equipped with a play area, 
but uh, you can see that there's nobody playing or no people uh, around the area because this photo is taken during the MCO. Uh, so perhaps uh, most of the people are inside the units. Yeah. And then what is typical, uh, what is typical is that uh, the housing, uh, vertical housing uh, concept uh, or the vertical housing design is that um, they always have this ground floor empty. Yeah? Uh, and normally you know, on daily basis, it was used as motorcycle uh, parking space. But uh, perhaps in a certain occasion, they can be an event space also where they have uh, the community can have their uh, weddings or birthday celebrations or community gatherings and so on. But it was a very basic and very minimum simmeranda kind of space and so on. Yeah. And uh, if you can see here, there are also pocket spaces, pocket space where for me, I think it's a missed opportunity because it was left unused. Uh, and if uh, for me, I think if it's treated properly, it can be a, a good a potential for social space and uh, to encourage a social uh, interaction. And with a poor management and also poor workmanship, also you can see that the, the housing quality is deteriorating uh, because you can see here it was built without apron. So whenever it rains, it splashed to the walls and then it got these uh, molds uh, on the wall. I was told that th this building is uh, occupied in 2018. Yeah, so it, it's basically it's a very recent project. So uh, it is surprising that uh, the building actually you can see if you go closer, you can see that the building is deteriorating. And um, okay, and these are other spaces. It was uh, supposed to be like green or landscape area for the community, but there was no allocation or no provision in terms of a design and also it was not included in the contract original contract of the housing so it was left just a space a bare space so you can see that uh, the rubbish being dumped of course it's poor management but um and uh also i i don't like to, to talk about the management side of it but uh, when you talk about housing, uh, whether you like or not, the management part also have to come in. Yeah, whereby if you give it to a, a good management, this kind of problem will, will be uh, won't, uh, we won't be facing this kind of problem. Okay, and you can see that the uh, the pigeon hole or the mailbox area becomes a place to put old furniture corridors without proper treatment to encourage interaction. Um, so basically, if you see the, that that's not much different from uh, Lembah Subang, the, the one that I showed uh, previously, it's just that the space allocation is bigger so that perhaps creates opportunity, but this, uh, it is actually a missed opportunity where it's not being utilized. Okay, and a provision of open corridors where it allows for ventilation and alternative usage of space. Uh, people put store, uh, people treat it as a storage space and also drying space again. Uh, but uh, actually, there's an argument whereby uh, uh, circulation space is some people or some literature will say that. Uh, 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 Corridor space is actually a transition space which is suitable for play and interaction and some literature, some scholars say that it's not. Uh, okay, and uh, I, uh, okay, this is uh, the leaf lobby. You can see how, how huge it is, but there's no um, activities, there's no treatment whatsoever. So again, it's a missed opportunity. Um, 
it can be an ideal social a social space or social interaction. Perhaps it can have uh, it at every level where they put uh, seatings and so on so that the people people can actually use it as a gathering space or social space. And at some houses, you just ignore the two ladies in the photo. Uh, okay, uh, so those uh, you can see at some uh, houses, they can even use it to put uh, their pets, uh, they, uh, they put their cat there uh, and uh, sit things on the uh, outside perhaps uh, in the evening they can have a chit chat uh, they can interact with the neighbors and so on yeah so um, okay so this one basically the reason why I choose this case study is to show uh, the lengthy uh, rejuvenation uh, project uh, done by uh, Institute Sultan Iskandar UTM and uh, a collaborative effort basically uh, with uh, Subang Municipal Council to rejuve uh, rejuvenate and empower the community towards a sustainable neighborhood. So basically, uh, similar to uh, Lembah Subang, but this one is a uh, medium rice or, or low rice. Uh, it uh, consists of a six story height. Um, and uh, basically, it was bare. It's just the units, and you have the field, you have the uh, ground floor for uh, the community to use. Yeah, so when ISI or Institute Sultan Iskandar uh, uh, went there, uh, we think about uh, rejuvenation and also empowerment. So, okay, this is roughly how uh, the, the, the overall layout. But the rejuvenation process, I think uh, Dr. Cairo, if Dr. Cairo is here, it's best to speak about this project because uh, it was done or conducted when uh, Dr. Cairo is uh, in Institute Sultan Iskandar. So basically, if you can see all the three uh, schemes uh, have this uh, similar, you know, uh, empty ground floors for those uh, for the social space yeah? uh, for these flats or this uh, apartment is okay because it's low rise but for lemba subang it doesn't work out well because it is a vertical uh, housing consists of uh, i think 20 story height so it's too high yeah and the provision of the open space on the ground floor is basically not enough Okay, so in, in Malaysia, we call this space as Kolong. Yeah. Uh, okay, so these are part of uh, the uh, literature uh, that I got from the book uh, that uh, our Institute Sultan Iskandar produced, uh, basically uh, to rejuvenate the area so that uh, it also can empower the community uh in a sense that uh when the design of uh, these houses uh bare and uh, uh not thinking about social space uh in detail perhaps they just assume that okay you have this typical layout and have the ground floor for the community to use and it's good to go yeah but it's not yeah uh, so uh this uh bukit puchong area bukit puchong project was uh occupied I, I i can't remember how for how long but there was no effort uh of uh you know uh making it look nice uh for the people so that 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 space become their space to you know interact and work together as a community to enjoy the space and to have a sustainable living so after institute sultan iskandar comes in uh, there are lots of programs being uh, introduced uh, that the creation of space and community participation in design and implementation of the spaces uh, and creation of space through collaborative effort being done and in fact, this project has uh, received uh, an award. Uh, I can't remember the name of the award, but this is a very significant project which has become a, a 
uh, president to all. Okay, so uh, and the other one is that I want to bring uh, attention to everyone is that the effort from a local authority, uh, which is uh, Dewan Bandaraya Kuala Lumpur in uh, and in addressing the issue of uh, facilities, yeah, because they, they actually look at it as facilities. Uh, the Kolong area or the ground floor space being empty, uh, it was supposed to meant for social activities, but there's no social activities being done, being being held other than perhaps uh, the wedding, kenduri, and so on. And uh, what they did is basically to inject in new activities uh new activities uh uh to, to support the uh, children uh in this uh social housing uh this one is in uh ppr jalan jelate and the other one i think uh, it's almost similar design uh the other one is desa tun razak yeah uh so basically in providing a, a library for the community to actually use it uh, for tuition and also there's also um, spaces for management office because there will be a, a management uh, committee to actually manage the rental or the, uh, the, the maintenance of the houses. And I think this is a, a great effort, yeah. But if you look at all three, yeah, if you look at three case studies, uh, an ideal uh, social space won't be achieved unless uh, local authority or third party comes in and interfere or uh, do the intervention. Okay, so, okay, um, I'm going to wrap up ready <laughs> don't worry uh, the success of the schemes actually relies on uh, effective control and enforcement by the authority they cannot do it themselves uh, however it can be improved by tackling on design elements uh, architectural uh, whereby a revised typical unit layout plan and typical details can be proposed yeah so i do strongly agree with this because if the uh, design for the social space were injected in at the early stage of the design, then the government, uh, I mean by the developer, then the government later on who take over the management of the uh, housing won't actually have to uh, fork out, you know, uh, more uh, to be financially burdened by providing all the facilities. Yeah, And basically, Provision, housing safety and provision of public amenities are the two most uh, important factors. Uh, and then uh, these two factors are actually below satisfactory level by uh, basically the, the surveys that have been done. And then uh, analytical approach is by handling defects and improvement schemes on these two factors may improve the degree of satisfaction on the existing low cost uh, PPR flats. But uh, as I said, it was like a, a, a later on intervention to actually equip or facilitate whatever the, the, the shortcoming. Uh, so another another thing, another finding from uh, the literature is that I want to quote is basically the building height and the ground activities. Yeah. So in the three cases, uh, three case studies, all of them relies on the ground activities or the ground social space. Yeah. But in this uh, literature, uh, Zinyi uh, 2018 and also Lee 1987, it says that it only effective up to uh, a fifth or sixth floor, whereby the upper floors won't be actually appreciating the ground uh, activities anymore. And also uh, the impact of the level of neighborhood whereby you uh, we actually categorize as neighborhood level one two and three to consider uh, the, the allocation of uh, social space yeah if it's too big then you might need more social space something like that
Okay. So in summary, from the identified case studies, it is concluded that the current housing provision neglected the social space needs, and even in cases where there are sufficient provision allocation, allocated, still requires management intervention as to community participation and control and detailed design of the allocated space to make it successful. Therefore, the social space design requires proper planning and the relationship between physical space and social behavior is described in different ways by various disciplines and research based on environmental psychology and sociology identifies social activities as a type of outdoor activities which is influenced by number of physical conditions with different level and type of activities have been having very different demands on physical environment social activities are all the activities that depend on the presence of others in public space according to gal 2001 and i also do agree on the uh, uh cultural you know when when uh, most of the people who live in the social housing they are basically some of them not all perhaps are from the squatters or and previously perhaps they are from the village or outskirts of uh, Kuala Lumpur, Johor and so on. So they, we have this uh, cultural, uh, what we call it, cultural uh, and also social behaviours, our own social behaviours, how we eat, how we greet people, how we meet, how we uh, do things. Yeah. But when you they move into this social housing, basically they have so like they have to leave it behind okay and you have to leave it within this new environment and um and it is actually surprising when i talk to uh people my friends in Kuala Lumpur, they all uh, they did the management of this ppr housing they said that in fact when the 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 tenant want to uh go in uh when they get the key uh, before that, they actually have to go these courses on how to actually uh, live within the new environment, yeah. So they, they so that they can adapt. But it's true, yeah. So and again, the pandemic situation also forced us to relook at the idea and planning for social space provision. And basically, the video that I'm saying just now is about uh, the the situation during the pandemic, whereby a family of, of four and six. Uh, have to make do with the uh to live within the box yeah uh, i call the housing unit as a box so i think uh that's that's all from me and uh i hope that uh, uh and i think uh it's very interesting to hear from uh professor minashi just now on uh, on housing and uh, basically, if uh, possible, or if there's any opportunity for collaboration on research, uh, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, collaborate. Yeah. So um, I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Akita Samsia, for an interesting sharing on case studies, looking at the way social neighborhood space is designed and utilized in affordable housing in Malaysia. Um, again, uh, thank you to all our speakers today. Now, um, we have come to question and answer session. Um, uh, we have a few questions for all the speakers. So let me read the first question. It's for Professor Gayatri. If referring to Indian culture and architecture, does the traditional Indian architecture show design aspects that respects to women's need? Okay, uh, Dr. Sura, that is actually a controversial question, but that's fine. See, uh, partially I would say yes, but uh, most of it, it was kind of no, because we are actually referring to the Indian traditional architecture, and you're talking about respect to women's needs. So it is most of it no, but I would like to uh, compare that or add that on to the question th three. I can see it here, which says that... Uh, uh, does the respect towards women needs also is reflective in Indian modern settlements, for instance, modern housing, 100% yes. It, right now, there is a lot of improvement because, as I said, uh, ladies have come out in a lot of ways. So, education, health, in every sector, we are there. And it is not about that we are talking about designers, planners. In general, when we talk about ladies, yes, the, the respect is seen. For example, even when we teach design, we uh, uh, to talk to the students uh, because they're talking about modern housing. Even if it is a residential design, they come up with a big uh, 
uh, what to say, 10 feet by 12 feet or 15 feet by 16 feet kitchen. The first question which we ask is, have you checked the work triangle? The lady of the house, did you talk to the person? Did you talk to your own mother? How much would she walk? Because most of the time, whether the mother is working or a housewife, doesn't matter. She's the one who's in all the spaces inside the house. So yes, uh, the woman's need is taken care of. And there are certain firms in India which actually cater to the woman's needs. Right. Thank you, Professor Gayatri, for your answer. Um, yeah, sure. uh, we, we should move to the second question, um, which is for Dr. Sharipa. It was a good, insightful presentation and sure was a learning experience. How do you foresee the utilization of appropriate space syntax for premium and complex projects like airports and hospitals, etc.? Okay. Hi. Uh, hi again. Thank you for the question. Right. How do I foresee it? <laughs> Premium and complex project is actually very useful. It is actually um, how can I say, um, such as hospitals, such as bridges. Uh, I'd like to direct you the attention to the building of the Millennium Bridge. If anybody familiar with that in the London, the Millennium Bridge was actually uh, designed before it was designed. The research of the space syntax came in and I was lucky enough to get involved a little bit of it, but at least I got involved with Foster's and company as well. What it is, it was just simply a simple, quite a very basic one, a very simple uh, axial analysis spanning the river of Thames, the Thames River, uh, trying to connect between the two uh, landmark, no to a landmark, which is actually the St. Paul's Cathedral, which is like on the uh, north bank, and the Tate Gallery, which is actually on the south bank. It was just purely a pedestrian bridge using space syntax uh, axial line analysis in trying to reduce or enhance, increase the connectivity, reduce, uh, reduce the, um, the segregation, but increase connectivity just using uh, by having that bridge mainly for pedestrians so it's very very important very very significant and very highly impactful the very very first day of its operation the uh, millennium bridge was uh, about one thousand oh, sorry one million people uh, actually crossing the bridge because it, it was like quite a, a kind of uh, something that has been long overdue that kind of structure to help ease the mobility for the pedestrians and of course the cyclists as well. So another one is actually on the Trafalgar Square. I don't have the slides here. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have the slides here. I've used my other lecture, Trafalgar Square. And if uh, I believe some of us are familiar with Trafalgar Square, the upper bit fronting the National Gallery uh, of the Trafalgar Square is actually it was at first it was just uh, not a pedestrian streets and the route coming down towards the Trafalgar Square itself was uh, actually uh, not very accessible and once the uh, space syntax tools come in and space syntax doesn't just work alone it is also accompanied here yeah? be supported by the observation of people's behavior on the street itself physical observation and uh, once the area was being modified in accordance to axial analysis, some other choice method, as well as the observation data, and the whole, uh, the whole livability, the whole space is transformed, more livable, and is is uh, is actually very easy uh, to give you know enhanced accessibility for people actually in the area. Did I answer the question? Another one is hospitals. Of course, currently I'm also involved in one work on hospital design, looking at the importance of these um, A&E, yeah? The uh, A&E, which is actually uh, emergency, you know, area of emergency, accident and emergency area. And we have had a problem last time in Jehovah, the city where we're in, it's also, this one is in Pasigudan. Pasigudan, there was a river, kind of a river in Pasigudan, in one of the districts, is actually being polluted 
and those people being transferred to the hospital, and they were being uh, it's actually ambulance being brought to the uh, ANE accident and, and emergency area. And the problem is with the layout of the of the ANE area itself, it's not really carefully uh, tabulated or calibrated in terms of the people's movement and the layout. So those actually inside and outside were also affected by the chemical, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 sorry, what do you call it? The evaporation, something like that. So that is actually very important. It helps in a certain way to understand the movement pattern uh, in this case to describe this place and help explain what is actually happening in terms of the layout, the structure of the layout of the space. Yep, that's my my answer. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Sharifa. There's another question for you. Um, it is very interesting using space syntax for doing research in understanding planning. What is the level of accuracy, accuracy in terms of finding using space syntax method? And to what level does it give reliable data if using space syntax as single tool in conducting research? It's a very, very uh, interesting and intelligent question. So does the above. Uh, space syntax is never, it's never a single tool. Yeah, it's never a single tool. It needs to be accompanied with the uh, physical data, which is actually the movement pattern or the mapping of the retail localities as well as crime localities in the mapping area, in the map, uh, in the area that we are mapping, or also the layouts of the buildings that we are ma mapping, yeah? And currently as well, uh, Space Impacts have been practicing on this integrated integrated urban mo modeling. The single tools of Space Impacts are being used uh, using DEFMAP analysis within the DEFMAP software itself. There are variables, there are a few variables of uh, spatial variables, but these spatial variables does not really, uh, it's only giving us a very um, primary, a very basic description of how the space is like and what is likely to happen if we modif modify the spaces. So it is never really a single tool. It needs to be uh, used within, uh, with other kinds of data, social data, configurative data, as well as non-configurative data. Yeah, but it does help, yeah? In terms of the accuracy, I think somebody mentioned about the accuracy of the findings. It can never really be that accurate, but I think so far it has been, I can say it has been quite like 95% accurate uh, in terms of the data, spatial data it produced. I'm just sorry, saying about the spatial data alone, alone I am not talking about the social data, though it is actually being supported by the social data or any retail data based on the research that we are pursuing. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Sharifa. Okay, um, there are two questions pro for Professor Minakshi. The first one is, in your opinion, what is the best practices to design place that we live in? As there are many factors nowadays that change the mindset of designers. For instance, much focus on profit making rather than the fulfilling uh, the needs of the people, culture or tradition. And the second one is one of the most challenging things right now in achieving the targets of this SDG by 2030 is funding. <laughs> what is your opinion will uh, what in your opinion will be the right or few of the right ways to enhance funding to ensure housing demands are met because ameliorating, ameliorating urban housing never look an easier thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 true. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, the world around right now is actually uh, coming of the common senses that uh, when we actually design the project, there should be a negotiation between individuals, institutions, and also there should be a collective uh, urban context as a planning, then initiating them, then projects are uh, concealed, then discussions happen, then the implementation happens. So what happens is there are a lot of different elements which actually come together and integrate into finding a right solution at the local level. I think that's the way we designers now have to look up. This is happening in a lot of Western countries. Um, when we showed the happiness index, the top countries in Canada, the, in 
can it also these things happen with they actually discuss discuss with the public what they want how they want and then design i think if that practice actually comes back to the society which was once part of the society in india if that comes back i think we are actually addressing a uh, lot of major issues regarding design of an individual it may be an individual house a uh, type of spaces we need in the type of social interactive spaces we need around the house at the neighborhood level and also at the city level so that's first one yes funding is the problem <laughs> sustainable goals to attain by 2030 um suppose uh, if we actually start planning at the local level i think a lot of community activities can move with the help of the community itself so if i take the responsibility of my community well being then i am actually contributing to my society so if my contribution is where funding comes the second important thing so sense of responsibility to the community should be given to take the ownership of the areas and i think by doing that the funding and achieving uh, aggregation of urban housing is not too far ago yeah, but it will take time community is just now realizing it responsibility it will take time good things always take time <laughs> agree on that <laughs> thank you <laughs> professor minakshi yeah, um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes um we have another questions for architect samsia Uh, in your opinion, in Malaysia, there are many cultures like Chinese, Malay, and Indian. Hence, this may affect planning of the housing. What is the best approaches to design affordable housing to cater for the needs of various different culture groups? As the main problem about housing is on costing within a strict layout, size, and uh, parameter. Costing is actually the major hindrance that does not allow designer to explore in design. What do you think? Yeah, ah, uh, Dr. Isora, I do agree with that. Ah, uh, basically, the terms ah uh, social housing and also affordable housing is basically, uh, I think, in my personal opinion, ah, uh, actually, ah, uh, uh, derives from ah uh, ringgit Malaysia or costing, yeah. Ah, uh, so that actually ah uh, force the government to actually categorize as. You know, categorize the funding for the social housing and affordable housing because by categorizing it, they will actually the government can actually decide on how much subsidy they can actually put in that group of housing. Yeah, but of course there are pro and cons to it. As we said just now, uh, it's a basically a cookie cutter concept of housing whereby uh you get one design and it's supposed to be. It is going to be forced to everybody to accept it, and uh, even as you said, in Malaysia there are Chinese, there are Indians, and also Malay. We all have a different uh, cultural practice, cultural background, uh, social background. Yeah, but when we actually force to move in, not I I don't like to use the word forced when you because you buy or you buy those housing units. And thinking that it's going to be okay, it's going to be a workout. But uh, the the social uh, social spatial issue issues or social space issues were not considered together with the unit design. So in that sense, you are sort of like your family were forced to be in that shoebox. And when you go out, you have to actually interpret or recalculate or reimagine the new social, uh, practice or a uh, social uh, or or uh, to actually, uh, negotiate on your neighbor's uh social practice. Yeah, so you are actually creating a community, but as uh Professor Moinakshi said just now, it takes time. One, it takes time for us to adapt, or perhaps we fail to adapt, and we have to rethink on how to actually provide a, a housing uh, provision that actually fits uh, each cultural values. For example, if you are Malay, uh, I did uh, an article about Malay houses and also the the, the modularity of. Uh, 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 Malay houses, 
basically uh, for your information the malay houses is actually modular in terms of the measurement not the two dimensional or three dimensional measure measurement but for the kitchen it's not modular because why the kitchen is always left to the ladies or the house to decide how it's going to be yeah that's the beauty of it yeah but when these houses vertical houses come in you just you know uh, rely on minimum size in the ubbl okay so that is the difference the huge jump that we basically as a society have to accept whether you like it or not so there should be a change in that yeah but of course when we want to change there's also another factor that we have to think of the developer might say that oh i will get less profit the government said oh the project will delay because of the negotiation process and the architects will say oh it's gonna take how many years you know to actually entertain the, the public the demand from the user and the, the, at the end of the day the occupants will say oh how long am i going to wait for for me to get the key you know so we have to negotiate those issues okay all right thank you okay samsia um, thank you for all the questions given to our honoured speakers today. Unfortunately, I have to close the Q&A session as we have reached the time given. And um, to those who have yet to fill in the attendance link to, uh, in the chat box, please fill it in uh, so that we can send you the webinar e-certificate later. Yeah? And then uh, before we end the session, I would like to ask all the attendees to switch on your cameras so that we can take a screenshot photos of your session today. Um, to com commemorate the International uh, Webinar Series number four. All right, um, smile everyone. One, two, three. Right. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we have come to the end of the session. Again, um, on behalf of the organizer, Program of Architecture, Uni University Technology Malaysia, I would like to thank all our speakers for our interesting and insightful sharing today. Uh, thank you, Professor Gayatri, Dr. Sharifa, Professor Minakshi, and Architect Samsia. I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, thank you to the audience as well. Um, it was a pleasure to have all, all of you uh, with us today. And please tune in uh, for our next international webinar series number five that will be coming up uh, at the end of this month, yeah, on the 28th of December. Um, we will share the, late, the details later. And um, have a good day ahead and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you everyone. all. Have thank a safe day. Well. Take care. Meet again. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.